Do we feel invited to God's great banquet in heaven? We may feel like the uninvited, those who don't belong. But as we learn today in our worship service, we are indeed invited, not because of anything we have to offer, but because of God's gracious mercy. The Lord be with you. And And also also with you. you. to be faithful, standing, standing steadfast. 
Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But, but they, they would, would not, not come. come. Often in our lives, Lord, we show that we don't want to come. Homework, Homework soccer, soccer games, dance, dance lessons, time in front of a screen, keeping up with friends, keeping up with the neighbors, just keeping busy. We have all kinds of excuses. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murders and burned their city. So too, we deserve nothing but punishment for putting everything in front of you. Then the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Lord God, help us to hear your call to all for mercy. Because of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, God looks not on our sin, but at the blood of Jesus which covers our sins. By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being.
Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and rules with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25. aged wine well refined and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people will he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it will be said on that day behold this is our God and we have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our epistle lesson is from Philippians, the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants who went out the roads and gathered all whom they found both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. for this morning's message is from the gospel lesson just read. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Over the last few months, we've been uninvited to many things. Jamie Pollard originally wanted 25,000 fans at the first Iowa State home football game, knowing it wouldn't be as packed as normal. But he had to settle for none that first game and only 15,000 last weekend. Admissions policies and numbers for the winter sports are still being developed, but it sounds like only 1,500 fans will be allowed in Hilton Coliseum for basketball games. As for the parable we hear today, people are uninvited to weddings because of the pandemic too. As groups of over 10 were discouraged as the pandemic began, Many people had to decide what to do with their weddings. Some delayed their weddings until later, hoping for a future time when large gatherings were safe and allowed again. Others went ahead with very small weddings, and others are still having to punt again. In today's parable, though, we have two groups of people who were uninvited from a wedding feast. The first group is made up of those who had been invited, had accepted the invitation, and then decided not attend at the last minute. The second group is the man who makes it into the reception hall but isn't wearing the right clothes and gets tossed out. Placed where it is in the story of Matthew 22 of Jesus teaching in Jerusalem during Holy Week, talking and confronting the chief priests and the Pharisees, following the previous parables, it's easy for us to read this parable a bit self-righteously. The guests who reject the invitation are the Pharisees and the chief priests. Those who've heard the invitation of God through prophets like Isaiah to join in a wedding feast and a great celebration. The servants were all those sent the, who sent the prophets of the Old Testament, sent to invite sinful, stubborn people to a celebration of love held by the God who'd chosen them. 
The destruction that comes upon them in the parable is Jesus predicting the destruction of Jerusalem that will come after Jesus tells this parable 40 years or so. And the people who respond to this second invitation are people like you and I, not of Jewish descent, but Gentiles, those who the message of Jesus went to after he was rejected by those he's talking to here in Jerusalem. But that's not all there is to the story. God doesn't stop inviting, and the world is still full of sinful, stubborn people who reject a gracious God's invitation. And so, we, as we look at those who reject the invitation after accepting it, we see how the busyness of the world can get to them and get to us too. Even before the pandemic, those who work with church metrics were saying to count people as regular attenders if they attended two or three times a month, because so much fewer people were attending church every week. After a large uptick in live stream church views at the beginning of the pandemic, over one-third of churchgoers had stopped even watching those back in May, and the numbers have gone down since then. We wonder how you could reject an invitation from a king, but we do that all the time. Which brings us to the man who gets uninvited after making it into the reception in the first place. The one who gets unmasked as an imposter. The wedding reception is fit for a king or at least a prince, yet is full of people who apparently never seen the inside of a castle. They don't know what fork to use. They don't know how to properly appreciate a good glass of wine. And they don't even know the host. They're all backup guests. And when you're a backup guest, when you know you weren't good enough or popular enough to get invited the first time, that makes it even harder. It makes it, you know you don't belong. You know you weren't the first choice, probably not even the second choice. But he only got invited when the hosts had paid for the food already and didn't want it to go to waste. That group of backup guests must have spent a lot of time looking at each other, wondering how they ended up where they were, wondering when they'd be uninvited and when they'd be found out as imposters. Because surely someone would discover they didn't belong. And so when someone is finally discovered who doesn't belong, who doesn't wear, who's wearing the wrong clothes, you have to imagine the tone of the feast had change. Instead of rejoicing, there'd be fear. One imposter was found out. What would happen to the rest of them? All the party guests must have wondered who was next. If one backup guest is rejected, why not all of them? When I was in college, my friends and I would often suffer from what, of our, what one of our professors called imposter syndrome. Even though we'd all gotten into a well-respected university, were part of the honors program, had strong GPAs, we kept all waiting to be found out as imposters. We waited for someone to figure out that we really weren't smart enough to be doing what we were doing. We kept waiting for someone to figure out we didn't belong. We kept waiting to find out we, were, we should be uninvited, that we were only backup choices. We'd only gotten in because more qualified students had chosen to go somewhere else. But no one came who came to the wedding feast in the parable was worthy of being there. They were all backup guests. No one had the right clothes invited as they were invited from the highways and byways. Those who were, you'd think would be worthy had rejected the invitation. Those who were there had not only been given the gracious gift of an invitation, but were given celebratory wedding clothes so they could fit in, so that they could enjoy the party without worries. What a wonderful gift. What else was there to do for them but rejoice? We too have been given a gracious invitation to the great wedding feast, the celebration of God's grace. We too come in wondering if we're worthy, wondering if we'll fit in, wonder if someone will realize it's a mistake and we'll be uninvited. And then we can try so hard to make sure we fit in that we miss the joy of the celebration. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is not to give grace, but to receive grace. We'd rather convince ourselves that somehow we receive grace because of some worth in ourselves because of something we've done. We want it so strongly we'll even make faith a work, something we do and choose for ourselves. But when we do that, when we reject God's free gift, we end up like that unfortunate, ill-dressed wedding guest. But the parable of the wedding feast and especially the last part 
isn't about a grumpy king who can't stand what young people are wearing these days or to make sure no one's wearing holy jeans or open-toed sandals. It's about our reception of God's gracious gifts. As Paul wrote to the Romans, be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ, or as he wrote to the Galatians, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Clothed in Christ, dressed as sharp as a groom at a wedding or a prince at a feast, not because of anything we did, but because of what Christ has done for us. Paul gives us a great list of virtues in today's epistle lesson from Philippians. But in his letter to Colossians, he doesn't tell them to just think on those things. He tells them to put it on. He tells them, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, for you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You've been given a great invitation, so put them on. Clothe yourselves with them. Clothe yourselves with these virtues. Wear them proudly. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, patience, gentleness, forgiveness, and love. Living not in fear of being found out as impostors, but knowing you have been called, that there's a place at the feast with your name on it, and a brand new set of dress clothes waiting. You've been clothed in Christ and are, will not be un, unworthy or uninvited again. And may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Deborah, originally from Trinidad, shared this testimony with a Gideon member in Tyler, Texas. We named it the greatest king of all. At age 14, I received my first testament from the Gideons while at school in Trinidad. I started to read it, but I didn't believe much of it because I was a Hindu. My parents brought me up to believe in the god of wind, Vayu. The stories about God in the testament were interesting enough to read, but that's all they were to me, stories. I kept reading it, though, throughout the years. At age 17, I found Mark chapter 6. Jesus commanded the wind to stop, and the wind stopped. This gave me pause. If Jesus could command the wind, then he must be more powerful than my Hindu God. In that moment, I didn't hesitate. I gave my life to him. Years ago, I lost my testament while I was moving. I was heartbroken, and I struggled to navigate life without God's word. I'm thankful to have another, also from the Gideons. I now continue to grow in my faith. If it weren't for the Gideons, I wouldn't know about the greatest king of all. What does it mean to be a Gideon? For the past several months, we've been talking about what it means to be a Gideon. What are the shared values among the members of our association? We identified three pillars that describe who Gideons are. Men of God, men of faith, men of action. These pillars remind us of who we are in Christ and the ways in which he can use us and our wives through the Gideons International. To be men of God, we need to face today's challenges and lead with integrity. To be men of faith, we need to develop a passion for using our God-given talents and boldly share Christ. Wherever we are, we step into our calling and leverage our influence to fulfill the Great Commission. To be men of action, Gideons around the world mobilize Christian business and professional men, empowering them to put their faith and God-given gifts into action to share the gospel with the world. One of the avenues that the Gideons use to make the name of Jesus known 
is to distribute Bibles and New Testaments in the traffic lanes of life. Here is an example of Gideons from different countries making the good news and the name of Jesus known. In January of 2020, before the COVID-19 pandemic, I visited the Philippines with men from five countries, including 17 men from the United States, to distribute scriptures. Teams were assigned to visit schools, colleges, and universities, police stations, jails, and prisons, and to distribute, hand out, and give person to person the Word of God. Teams of three to five Gideons traveled throughout the cities and countryside to designated locations and offered a smile and a priceless gift. The acceptance by the Filipinos was eager and respectful. In many schools, as we went from classroom to classroom, I would ask the teacher if I could speak for a few minutes. Nearly all allowed me to introduce the students to the New Testament. The Gideon's New Testament has a signature page for ownership, a section for helps to deal with life's challenges, and inside the back cover is a set of verses describing the love of God for each of us, beginning with John 3.16. I was thrilled to be able to share the love of the Father with many students. They were attentive and followed in their own personal copy of God's Word. Thank you for your support and encouragement of the Gideon Ministry. Thank you for sharing the talents of many of your members, along with those of other local churches. As we met with the hundreds of Gideons and Auxiliary members in the Philippines, we rejoiced in being called to participate in this simple, well-defined association called the Gideons International. From the first Bibles placed in hotels in 1908, at a cost of 28 cents for a King James and 36 cents for the brand new American Standard Version, to the amazing cost of around $1.25 today. A New Testament with the books of Psalms and Proverbs can be placed into the hands of millions of the needy and lost in the United States and in countries around the world. The Gideon's organization has grown from two Christian salesmen sharing evening devotions to nearly 270,000 members in 200 countries today. All are members of local evangelical churches and are recommended or endorsed by their own pastor. Today, the Gideon's International Association is the most effective Bible distribution organization in the world. And who gets the praise for this? Only Jesus, for He truly is the greatest King of all. Today, Gideon's and Auxiliary are giving testaments one to one. The visiting plumbers, electrician, and movers all gladly received a personal pocket testament at my house. Gideons are still placing full Bibles in the new hotels as they are completed in Ames. The door will open for general population placement soon and we will be ready to meet people where they are and introduce them to the hope that we have in Christ. As you return to church, be sure and pick up the Gideons and Expression cards located on the display. These are another avenue for giving and supporting the purchase and placement of scriptures. The Story County Camp sends cards to elected officials and to the precious pastors of our local churches to remind them that we are praying for them and their families, especially during this time. Thank you and God bless you.
thank you for inviting us to your wedding feast through your Son, Jesus Christ, who has opened your kingdom to all believers. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Send us your Holy Spirit so that each day we respond to that invitation, making you first in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Be with those in need, those who are ill. Don Zenner, who had surgery, and Lisa Clayberg's father, Steve Deering, who all had a heart attack, thanking you that they're both home now. And for those we name in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Bless the work of those who share you with people in other lands. Our missionaries, Deborah St. Deborah St. Ongi in Latin America and the Caribbean, Amy Sima in Cambodia, both who celebrate birthdays this week, the Lutzes in Papua New Guinea, the Clausings and Grokis on furlough from Africa, Kabetta and his family in Ethiopia, Nathan and Beth Tanjas in China, the Hansons in Korea, and Amanda Groshek in Ukraine who celebrate birthdays this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the work of those who slow to try to stop and spread and slow the spread of COVID-19 and help those affected in any way by the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Help us to share our faith so that through us and others, people can come to know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Make us thankful for all your blessings to us, even in the little things in life, like Indian summer weather and the sight of mums in bloom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Help us when we doubt, when we feel that we're uninvited to put our trust totally in your invitation. All this we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread, and forgive us our, our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, the source of every blessing, your generous goodness comes to us anew every day. By the work of your Holy Spirit, lead us to acknowledge your goodness, give thanks for your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.